Good afternoon. Um, as Peter said, I'm Ken Walton, classical music critic of the Scotsman, but more recently co-founder of the classical music website Vox Carnix, which Keith Bruce and I set up last summer to fill a gap we felt existed in the coverage of classical music in Scotland. We're delighted to be involved with St Mary's in this series of cultural conversations. The first of these events last month focused on the school's proposed move to the former Royal uh, High School building in Carlton Hill. Today's discussion also makes reference to hills, but this time as the inspiration for a truly ambitious composition project called the Seven Hills, a, refer a reference of course to Edinburgh's Seven Hills, not Rome's, which has grown considerable arms and legs since its initial conception as an initiative to help mark the school's 50th anniversary in June 2023. So what's it all about? Well, with me to talk about the multiple strands of Seven Hills are Paul Stubbings, who's Director of Music at St Mary's, prolific best-selling author poet, St Mary's Heritage Ambassador, and of course, bassoonist with the infamous Really Terrible Orchestra, Alexander McCall Smith. Pivotal to the project's delivery is Valerie Pearson, Head of Strings at St Mary's, whose particular expertise in the area of outreach education has played a significant role in uh, expanding the scope of the initial idea. And finally, Jay Caperold, one of Scotland's most exciting young composers from New Cumnock, whose most recent commissions have included a work for the 2020 BBC Proms, premiered in Glasgow last summer by the BBC SSO, and a new flute concerto, I think, for Catherine Bryan and the RSNO. Um, Jay will talk about the theory of the earth, which is the work arising from his commission for the Seven Hills project. So Paul, if I could turn to you first, I mean, how did all this start? Tell us something about the genesis of Seven Hills. Okay, well, it's a long story, so uh, get your seatbelts on. Um, uh, we wanted to um, do something distinctive for our 50th birthday. And, uh, you know, there are lots of things that we could have done. Uh, and we'd been thinking at the time about the sort of distinctive features of our school. And um, uh, two things came up in my mind. First was chamber music. That's, that's always going to be a feature of a school that's actually really quite small. And it's been a feature really from our birth uh, back 50 years ago. Uh, and I fully uh, expect that it will be a feature, you know, going forwards uh, for the next 50 years. So that was the first thing really, chamber music. And the second thing uh, was our home of Edinburgh, this beautiful cultured centre. Uh, which we do uh, love to call our home. So really those uh, were, were the essential features, but uh, of course, uh, education and performance, uh, these are the mainstays of our daily work. So uh, it, it ha had to incorporate those things. Those are really the, the sort of key ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted this to be a long run in because uh, you know the 50th birthday is looming and um, we wanted somehow to have sort of stepping stones along the way. And instead of stepping stones, uh, came up with the idea of uh, these sort of foothills to a great sort of event, the foothills being the seven hills of this uh, home of ours in Edinburgh. And, and by those hills, we could uh, raise, or through those hills, raise awareness of, uh, in a sort of measured way, in a sequential way of our birthday, and also of specialist music education that's happening so, uh, so vividly in this town and in this country. So, um, of course, the extra musical angle of the hills, um, of, of a sort of a topographical approach, uh, might be a celebration of Edinburgh uh, in itself. And, um, and that was always going to bring some interest from those who are not necessarily interested in new music or, or chamber music. So it, that seemed to be a, a nice sort of way to, to, to catch, uh, uh, catch your imagination, perhaps. And there's also a little uh, energetic leitmotif going on here is in that the Seven Hills, uh, some of you are Edinburgh based, I'm sure that you'll know that the Seven Hills is also a race around the Seven Hills and it's something to which our uh, head teacher contributes annually. Um, so the ideas of uh, exercise and health and outdoors and air and Scotland's great, uh, you know, great living um, also could be captured in this project. Uh, and perhaps also help with fundraising, uh, as indeed it, it already has. So um, we had that uh, creative germ then of the Seven Hills and hoping that with a long run that could be a, a kind of catch all uh, where we could excite present audiences uh, and look for new ones. And where pupils new to the school who we don't know yet 
in the coming years and maybe new teachers and new influences could bring their own ideas to the table. It wasn't going to be set in stone, it was going to be something that uh, is uh, dynamic as we say. And uh, I'm very pleased that um, Alexander McCall Smith has invited uh, his own sort of uh, um, milieu to join in this uh, in this project and we have somebody who he knows, Ryan Rutherford is a filmmaker. He's also been invited to take part and I'm very excited to welcome him uh, and bring him onto this table to, to help us with this, uh, this, as you say, a, a, a large uh, cultural ambition. And so the interest and the energies and the interpretation of these people, not least the composers themselves, uh, was going to make sure that every hill, every stepping stone, every foothill to this great event was going to be very different and very distinctive. I'm nearly done. So the key aim for me really is that specialist music education, uh, an area where we are sector leading, uh, was going to be right at the heart of this. So uh, educational projects alongside, not alongside, but really embedded in. And that's where Valerie Pearson comes in, our head of strings, and you'll hear from her later. She's doing a great job in shaping that area. Um, but of course, it's not just doing this performance, it's actually sharing. Um, and uh, the, the composers themselves are uh, joining in this um, uh, sort of ambition to share. Um, and taking the idea out to their own local areas of activity, places where they were born or places where they work, and maybe working with local schools to look at their own topographical features in their area as stimulus. Um, and so I know it sounds a bit uh, too ambitious, but this becomes then a Scotland wild, a Scotland wide celebration, a celebration of Scottish music uh, and of the beautiful place where we live. Alexander McCall Smith, uh, his effortless and priceless poetry is a splendid boon to this project and he has given that very generously. He's been a terrific supporter of our school for many, many years. And as you may know, he is also a terrific composer, uh, a terrific um, supporter of composers. I, he may be a terrific composer as well, I don't know that. A terrific uh, supporter of composers and of the arts and of new music. So that was always going to be a really, really a good um, uh, tie into this project. I'm so pleased that he is with us here today and he is very much part of this project. And I will never forget uh, a trip to that very room where he's sitting now to hear the poetry being read to me privately. That was one of the lovely occasions in the last few years. So thank you for that, Alexander. Um, and I am utterly thrilled to have Jay as our first composer because uh, he really is one of our shining lights uh, in Scotland and in the UK and no doubt before long uh, on the worldwide stage. I heard his Christus Tantacticus um, several years ago now and I was completely blown away by it. It was just uh, uh, something I'd never really heard before. And so to have him shape or help us to shape the initial project, uh, where we are indebted to him. So uh, we'll hear from him later as well. So there we are, Ken, sorry about that, a bit too long. No, no, thank you, Paul, that's perfect. And, and a great um, sort of um, opener to, to what this is all about. I wonder if I could turn out to Sandy. Um, I mean, you've long been a, su a great supporter of St. Mary's. Um, we've heard that you, you, know, you were obviously brought into this project. What did you actually feel about getting involved in this? Well, Ken, it, it's always a terrific pleasure to, to do anything with uh, St. Mary's. It's such a wonderful institution, and anybody who's involved in it, uh, as we all know, uh, finds it a, a very re rewarding and, and, and marvellous thing to be associated uh, with, with them. Uh, so when um, uh, Paul ca came to see me and discussed this, raised the, the issue, asked me to write something, uh, I... Um, uh, really f felt that I wanted to do something special for this. Uh, I very much love working with um, with composers. I've uh, I've been writing quite a lot uh, for composers uh, over the last few years, and uh, for a novelist, it's a wonderful chance to work with work with somebody. Uh, so um, I was I was very pleased to be um, invited to to do this. I think St Mary's is is, is just such a it's such a lovely idea that we have this institution 
which provides this superb musical education for uh, children uh, from all, all over Scotland. I think that's the the the, the marvelous aspect of it. This is a this is a, a, a treasure for the, the whole country, and that uh, any child who is has the talent uh, and who gets a place can study there. I think that's a marvelous a marvelous thing. And of course, I'm very very much in favor of the of the the project uh, to uh, to move to the the old uh, Royal High School. Uh, I think that that is a very very important building in this very crucial part of of, of Edinburgh part of the World Heritage um, site of, uh, of Edinburgh. And I think what better, what better use for it than uh, St. Mary's um, Music School. So it all came together. Good. I wonder, I, tell us something about how the poetry materialized. When indeed, was it something that you conceived right at the start as, a, as an entity or has it grown with you? Did you actually walk around the hills and- <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I was worried, Ken, that you were going to say, when did you last climb all seven, <laughs> seven hills of Edinburgh? Let alone, when did you <laughs> last run round them? I'm very conscious of the fact that lots of people, uh, including people from St. Mary's who are running around them. Uh, I do climb one of them quite, quite often. I often go up Craig Lockett Hill. But, uh, and I, I, I ride on my bicycle around Arthur's Seat and Salisbury Crags, which uh, Jay, Jay's been writing about. But yeah. um, uh, no, it, it happens very quickly. I, I find that um, I, I'm one of the, these people who, who write rather quickly. Um, uh, it, it, it comes to me and uh, I don't really have to, to sit around very long. Um, and indeed, I don't think one should ever as an author sit around and wait for the muse to come and tap you on the shoulder uh, because she, she, she never will do that. So you have to sit down, right? So I sat down and wrote them and I wrote them, I think very quickly. Uh, I, I can't recall exactly uh, how long it, it took but e each of these would have been written in a, in a, in a single session um, mm -hmm. of um, uh, you know, half an hour or whatever each of the poems. They, they come out f fully formed really. Uh, and so it was. It wasn't a difficult thing for me uh, to do this. I wish I could say to you that I sweated away at it, Ken, but I, <laughs> I, I didn't. And that's where I always feel when I'm working with composers, they're the ones who've got all the hard work. My yeah. job writing the words is 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 terribly terribly <laughs> easy. Um, so they they all came to me. I, I've written a, a, quite a lot about Edinburgh. I did a book called A Work of Beauty, which was all about Edinburgh, based on. Uh, a wonderful collection of um, old photographs of Edinburgh from the historic environment Scotland. And um, so I write a lot about Edinburgh and I've just written quite a lot of poems about Edinburgh in my Scotland Street books. I usually put a poem at the end, which I put into the mouth of Angus Lordy, but really it's me. So it, 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 was, a, it was a labor of uh, labor of love. And these hills are so interesting because all of these hills have a lot of historical associations about them. Everything in Edinburgh has a lot of history behind it, often really rather unpleasant history when one starts to look into it in that uh, things have happened that we might perhaps best, best forget. But um, uh, so, so there we are. And, and this particular one that uh, Jay has, has, has looked at and is going to work on is uh, uh, that, that that's a well-known bit of uh, Edinburgh's landscape and of course, it's got a major historical story behind it. It's a very, very significant bit of rock that. Mm -hmm. This is Arthur's seat, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, interestingly, you're talking about Jay and, and working with the composer there. When you're in writing this poetry with the knowledge that this was going to be turned in some way into a, a musical composition, did that in any way influence how you wrote the words? Um, uh, not really, interestingly enough, in, in that I, I find that uh, uh, very occasionally I will write, I will pay particular attention to meter, for ex mm -hmm. instance. Um, I've recently been working on and have completed um, a full length uh, operatic libretto with a, a co composer based down in, in London, uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Hyde. Mm -hmm. And um, I paid much more attention to meter there because uh, I knew the sort of effect that uh, Tom wanted to achieve. Uh, but when I work, um, as I often do, for example, with to uh, Tom Cunningham, who's choral mm -hmm. composer, um, I find that my words, uh, I, I, I make the running in a sense, my words happen to fit the sort of thing Tom wants to, to, uh, to, to, to write. 
So I'm conscious of the fact that there's going to be somebody uh, looking at it and trying to work at it. Uh, very occasionally, I have to remind myself to be careful about um, the use of particular words or particular collections of words because the composer will come along and say, if it's going to be something that's going to be set and is going to be sung, the, the composer will come along and say, you know, singers can't do that or their tongues will get twisted if you if you do that. But mm -hmm. but generally speaking, it's it's a subconscious pro process uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I don't really have to um, have to, to to bear in mind what is going to be done to it. It just instinctively, I think I produce what, mm -hmm. what I think will work. Yeah, interestingly, as, as I understand it, these are not necessarily settings. Um, I mean, you mentioned your work with settings. Does it excite you that this type, this in this occasion, it might inspire something that's completely wild and, uh, a, you know, adding new dimensions that perhaps you'd never thought about before? Yes, Ken, Ken absolutely. I, I think that that's very that, that's that's very exciting for me because uh, usually it's uh, I'm I'm writing words which will then be set. Uh, so this is the, this is a, a departure, and this is this is I suppose even more interesting from the point of view of the of of the wordsmith, mm -hmm. in that uh, one is going to see what uh, another uh, creative mind intelligence is going to do to the words that you, you've you, you've said. It's the same as as when you write something which you know somebody is going to make a film about or might make a film about. Although there, of course, your heart is in your mouth, because filmmakers often take terrible liberties <laughs> with what you what you write. Um, uh, composers, uh, I think it's it's different with composers. Interestingly enough, when when I heard that uh, I'd never worked with with Jay Jay Bourne, indeed we haven't really we haven't talked about this particular this particular piece. Um, but uh, when I listened to his uh, his music, I thought. Uh, that I, I was very excited because it, it struck me that uh, he was just the right person for this geological phenomenon because his music is very forceful and very, uh, I, well, I don't want to use the word sparky, but there are sparks uh, in it. And of course, Arthur's seat, we're talking about a geological uh, phenomenon here, a very, very important one. There is, of course, another artistic dimension in this, in that we have Ian McIntosh's illustrations. Mm. Um, I mean, how did that? How did they come about? Well, I Ian McIntosh is, is I think, uh, probably our best illustrator in Scotland. Uh, he and I have uh, worked together um, for a, for a long time, for many many years. Uh, he was the illustrator who did the uh, Seven Hills. Uh, sorry, who did the Scotland Street. Uh, books and there I see we've got his seven hills illustra illustrations there. Um, so Ian is is a, a wonderful uh, illustrator. His illustrations are lively, uh, they're humorous, uh, they're immediately appealing to a very wide range of people. Um, and as I say, we've worked together for decades. He does uh, the the jackets of many of my books. He does. For example, the American editions of the Number One Ladies Detective Agency. That's all Ian's work. Um, he's an artist who's at the height of his powers, and uh, he's the most generous, uh, generous of men, um, generous and gracious of men. And uh, so uh, I'm thrilled that he's in, involved in in this because people love his work. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, Valerie, I wonder if I could move on to you at this point. I mentioned earlier that your role is pivotal in all this. Um, at what point did you get involved and what potential did you see in expanding and developing the initial idea? Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's probably worth saying that I actually only joined St Mary's um, back in September. Um, so you can imagine this... <laughs> This is an incredibly exciting project to discover, um, literally sort of in an office one day, um, that was going to lead to a very, very exciting three years. Um, when I um, was first presented with the project, um, obviously the poems had been written, the illustrations had been commissioned, and um, Paul had led um, uh, the, that first initial vision of leading up to the 50th birthday with the Seven Hills. 
and the composers and the idea of the commissions um, which would be uh, performed in each of our end of term concerts over the three years leading up to the 50th birthday that had already been decided but I think um, I think Jay had been involved in a conversation possibly about um, sort of sharing his expertise as a composer um, in some workshops. Um, but when I arrived, I just got incredibly excited about this project because my own background is, is sort of a combined portfolio of performance and composition and education. And so this immediately kind of like tapped into all my worlds and probably because I've been part of um, sort of similar projects bringing different elements together. I was very, very keen to try to really extend those uh, sort of like ideas of, of supporting new music, supporting real excellence in education, um, but actually offering them out um, to, to extend the project so that we really actually celebrated Edinburgh, all of the people, all of the institutions, all of the partnerships that we have already started to enjoy and the possibility of so many more. So um, for me, it was really uh, to find sort of endless ways, um, especially with the cyclic nature of the, the project sort of coming back every year to sort of have these ongoing um, performances to just see how far we could push that out to engage as many elements of Edinburgh. So I, I quickly thought of all of the, the sort of important groups, um, but I'm gonna talk about that um, maybe a little bit later. It might be worth just um, discussing the, the composers yeah. to start off with. Um, so the, the composers that we're going to um, have it as commissions are um, illustrated here. So the the first commission um, at the top is Jay Caporal. He will be talking about himself later on, so I, I won't say anything about that. Um, Tom Wilson, um, he's a teacher at St Mary's and has been for many years. He also teaches competition at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Um, originally from Manchester, he's definitely embedded in Scotland. And at this point, we start to see the theme that connects uh, the choice of the composers, which was that there was an aim uh, for each of the composers to have a connection to St Mary's Music School itself, or um, to have a connection to new music in Scotland that in some way reflected um, back to the school. Um, Neil Thomas Smith is an alumnus of the school, um, who has gone on to uh, study in Stuttgart and now teaches in Maastricht. Um, Helen Bright, an alumna of the school, a very established composer in fact. Um, she was, uh, her piece of Berger was selected as one of the best 10 new classical works of the 2000s uh, by the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. She's published by Novello. Um, Amy Robertson, um, very successful composer. She's also got um, a career as a, a harpist. Um, she's currently um, the composer in residence of Glyndebourne, um, and her music actually spans a few areas, um, in sort of including paths towards sound art. Simon Smith is an alumnus of the school and um, has made renowned recordings of. Um, I guess mainly contemporary classical uh, piano repertoire. David Horn, an alumnus of the school, is currently head of composition at the Royal uh, Northern um, College of Music. And there in the centre is Sir James Macmillan, our, one of our vice presidents. And so if we follow that clockwise, that gives us um, a series of new works that will lead to new commissions. Um, leading up to the 50th celebration in the middle. So perhaps if we could um, just move on in the slides. Um, they are going to, here we, I've just set out the different um, performances and there we have the 50th anniversary concert in the centre. 
Um, I, um, I think, um, so that's where the project was uh, when I came on board. And that was how the, the composers were selected. Um, can I just ask you? Can I, something about Sorry, Valerie. Can I just ask you? Um, I'm interested to know um, what, how you, how you, how you're sort of um, uh, dealing with this in terms of the St Mary's pupils. I mean, what, what do you expect of them in this, and what should they expect to gain from it in return? Um, well, just leading on um, from uh, the, the sort of demonstration there of the premieres, I think the unique opportunity for St Mary's students is that they will actually primarily be the performance of these premiere compositions, mm -hmm. uh, performances. And um, we will actually have um, one or two professional performers joining that, that chamber group for each piece. So for example, our, our first premiere um, involves Tom Hunter, who um, is a freelance percussionist working often with the SCO. Um, and just this is a, a, an absolute gift of an experience for a young musician um, to, to actually be involved in that process from the initial conception of a new work to, to actually engage in regular rehearsals with a professional musician to actually go through that process of, of the, the composer themselves working with them and, and then to have that exceptional experience of being the, the performers that, that gave that first performance um, and to, to enjoy the spotlight that the project will, will give to this. Um, I think if we sum all of that up, the, the project's really offering a, a total step up in the, the sort of offerings that we, we, the opportunities we give to the students. Um, it's definitely elevating you know, activities that are done at school into the professional world. Um, the, the inevitable consequences of this is that we are, by example and by doing, actually making new music and creativity part of the activity in school. And it's not just one small event. You know, this will be repeated seven times. And I love the fact that there will be an accumulative effect. You know, so by the time we get to the fifth composition, our, our students will have handed over this baton of being pioneers in new music. I can see that the composition department will flourish. Um, and we, we haven't quite mentioned it yet, but um, part of our outreach work is very much centered on the students um, going out and actually working um, on composition workshops and leading composition workshops and also having to um, have compositional ideas that they they need to work out how to develop with people so um, in terms of one of our jobs just in a sort of more technical side is to prepare our students for a professional career in music and I think these activities are reflecting perfectly the, the modern musical landscape you know we can't just produce trained instrumentalists that will have a very secure job in an orchestra. You, you know, the, the current landscape requires a portfolio of, of skills um, and sort of like a, a sort of genuine desire to engage uh, musical activities, to share expertise um, and to make sure that music continues to flourish. I was going to ask you if you expected there to be a legacy from the, the Seven Hills project. I suspect that that is part of it. Is, it. is there anything else you can say about that? The legacy? Um, well, if I could... Um, there's there's um, so many... There are actually so many possible answers to this question, but um, if I could just move on um, to the, the next slide. Um, the, the one with the website address at the top. Um, what I've done is just produce the slide to actually show very quickly to everybody <laughs> the, the different areas that are part of, of this project. Um, 
And at the top, you'll see that there's a website URL there. Um, this project's been developed by me in the time of COVID. And actually, um, one huge aspect of the project is that we will have a dedicated website. Now, in normal times, that might just be a kind of landing page to connect uh, people to the project and to the events. But I think um, sort of reflecting modern times, what this uh, website will also do will be um, a sort of online and an ongoing online publication of all of the activities in the project. So the first answer to your question um, in a very modern uh, realm is that people will be able to access videos of the of the premiere performances. They'll be able to access um, works that students have um, devised in regional workshops or with our Edinburgh primary schools. Um, and in that sense, uh, we, we'll also be able to have very site specific works, sound walks. The, the facility of the website means that we have a way of documenting and archiving. And because the project will be three years in length, um, this will in turn become a sort of modern form of publication online. In a more traditional sense, we should have at the end of the project um, the seven new works relating to the hills, and they will be published accordingly. So if there's a, a sort of more traditional paper score that can be provided, um, we, we plan to publish um, those scores as a special seven hills project. Um, Again, if they happen to be a piece of sound art, we can facilitate the website um, to, to sort of find ways of publishing the, these as an archive. We're hoping that our educational work will turn into um, educational resources that we will be able to sort of offer for uh, free out to um, the education of Scotland. So, um, yeah, and, I, and we hope that this will continue to. I mean, this is so huge now. I mean, we could actually talk an hour on, on, on its own uh, <laughs> this project. Um, but I wonder if I could just move on to Jay for a minute um, and just uh, mm -hmm. ask you, first of all, Jay, um, on, the on the work that, that you've chosen to do, I mean, how did you get, to, did you get to choose the poem uh, to work to? How did you end up with Arthur's Seat? Yeah, I was very, very fortunate that we were given uh, a choice as well. So it was a real pleasure to be able to read through uh, Alexander's different poems and to be able to, to select the one that I've uh, ended up selecting. Um, and uh, just to say, first of, first of all, as well, is that it's just such a privilege to be involved in, in this project. I mean, as you can hear, there's, um, from what Valerie's just described, is that there's a, a huge benefit um, or a hierarchy of benefits, you know, from young people right down to the sort of wider communities and things. And that it's just such a, a, a pleasure and privilege to be involved in, in something that's able to, to give back in that way. But um, yeah, so the, the poem that I selected from um, Alexander McCall Smith's selection is, is his poem called uh, Arthur Seat and Geology. And so I was really drawn to this poem in particular, uh, primarily because of its highly evocative imagery and the sort of descriptions of Arthur Seat and its uh, mythology. Um, and so I, I could immediately um, imagine that as a kind of um, a musical landscape, as it were. Um, and I suppose, you know, there, there can, going back to what we were talking about um, beforehand, there can be a bit of a challenge in, in turning words in, into music. But for me, I always find it um, to be a process that's, that's a real joy, actually, because the whys of the concept are already set in stone, as it were. So the way that I tend to approach composition generally is that, on the one hand, there are the what's and the how's of composition, which um, for me are essentially the, the pragmatics of the composition. So um, in other words, who's playing what, uh, on which instruments, and how does that all come together to form the, the piece? And so on the other hand, there's the why's. Um, and to me, the, the why's are much more exciting because they relate to the artistry of the composition. Um, and so I suppose, what I mean by that is the, you, you can ask questions in terms of why is an instrument acting in a certain way and why does that then relate to the, the concept of the music? Um, and so I find those really exciting as a composer because they, you know, they open us up to ask bigger questions, um, which I suppose brings me on to um, James Hutton, um, who's regarded as, as the kind of founder of modern geology. 
uh, and Alexander refers to, to Hutton in, in, this, in this poem in particular um, and the important discoveries that he made um, at Arthur's seat. And so this, this was a man who was in search of the answers to those big questions. You know, why are we here and, and how, did, how did we get to a point, a point in time such as the present? You know, um, and so what he did was um, he analysed the, the rock formations, at a, a section of rock at Arthur's seat, which um, quite rightly now is, is known as Hutton's section. Um, and so from this, he hypothesised and put forward the idea that the earth uh, was made up through a continual process of renewal and decay. And so that, that process actually happened over millions of years. And so at the time that he, he made these discoveries or put forward that hypothesis, it was um, 1788, I think. Um, and so at that time, it's quite a, quite a controversial um, doctrine to put forward because, you know, unseated sort of long held religious notions about how the earth was created and how, how old it actually was. Um, and so all, all of that in the mix, you know, so you've got Alexander's poem, you've got Arthur's seat itself, and then you've got James Hutton's findings. How, how do I put all of that into music, essentially? So that, that was the real challenge. Yeah. On that point, I wonder if this point, at this point it might be worth um, hearing the poem from Sandy. Would you be happy to, to read us that? Yes, Ken, of course, yes. Um, here it is, um, Arthur's Seat and Geology. This is a crouching lion, watching as crouching lions will do over the territory of a circumscribed backyard. This hill had the crusty lion heart of a volcano, now no more. It lives on memories of long, cooled, fiery moments. It never vitrified a city as Vesuvius did. Its belches frightened nobody, as there was nobody then to frighten. Now we climb innocent children on rocks that once glowed red, follow an easy route to the summit, close our eyes and feel the breeze that whips round the Pentlands or goads us with its North Sea taunts. Even in retirement, though, the crags that frown on Holyrood make something happen when James Hutton looked at them, reached a moment of understanding and realized the theology of creation was all wrong. The earth to Mr. Hutton seemed punished by its energy, twisted into shapes imposed by a molten and unforgiving heart. Here and there, in efforts of escape, mountains shrugged off the constraining mantles, displaying for us to see if only we would look the history of all things in lines of rock, layers of magma, fossils, littered paths of glaciers. How it humbled him to read that past and see how long it was. Wonderful and beautifully read, I have to, I have to say. Um, I wonder what Mendelssohn would have made of that. <laughs> Given that he, he took himself up there, didn't he? Um, coming back, Jay, um, the... the there's a, there's a much wider aspect to this with you because you're taking this back yourself to East Ayrshire, to Cumnock. Um, and uh, tell us something about what you plan to be doing there. Um, so that, that's, yeah, so you're referring to the, the sort of workshops and the, the education um, side of things. So um, this is something that Valerie and I have been, have been talking um, at length about over the last few months just to um, try and firm up exactly what we're hoping to, to bring in. I'm, I'm very keen that we um, we try to find certain schools um, which are, um, as it were, um, under-resourced perhaps, um, for want of a better term. And I can say that particularly because um, I grew up in Ayrshire, I went to the schools in Ayrshire, so I know what's missing from, from these places and, and they tend to be areas of um, multiple deprivation um, in particular. And I remember growing up um, and, and attending high school at Cumnock Academy in particular. And we were very, very fortunate that on the odd occasion, Scottish Chamber Orchestra players or RSNO players um, were able to, to come and, and, and visit us um, and to sort of lead workshops and things, but they were so few and far between that you felt that there was this, you got a, a small tiny glimpse of the wider world that's out there and you knew that there was more that you could, that you could explore, but unfortunately the schools at that time and, and local councils weren't able to, to bring those musicians in on, on a regular basis. And so what we want to, to do through 
uh, the, the workshops is to target schools who may not necessarily have access to um, the type of high quality music making, the type of high quality composition um, experience in workshops, um, and also just generally the, the, the sort of um, the sort of high quality music making that, that can that can take place and also to be introduced to their peers who are um, performing at an incredibly high level um, and I think that's that's an incredibly important aspect for young people is to see that their peers are able to achieve great things through music um, and so we want to be able to to bring the the young musicians of um, St Mary's Music School to um, you know places like Cumnock Academy, which is now the, the Robert Burns Academy, um, because some of those, those schools have, have now merged. Um, and we want to introduce these brilliant young musicians to some of the, the higher and advanced higher kids who may themselves potentially want to go on to study music at a higher education uh, level. So that, that's really what we hope to achieve through this is that we can, uh, we can, we can just have some fun and, and really get some great qual high quality music happening. Wonderful. Well, um, we've heard um, from all our four participants and, and uh, it's, it's really, to me, um, materialising into a very exciting project. Um, you have answered my questions and I'm wondering if now the, we, we go over to those, um, our audience here today to see if they have any questions they would like to ask our um, four main speakers. Um, Peter. Yes, I have uh, one or two questions for you. Um, one of the questions has to do with, will these be digitally recorded and available is one. And I do, uh, although one of the questions has been answered, someone did point out that there were eight composers, not seven <laughs> that were presented. Well, perhaps we could maybe just uh, cl clear up the, uh, the, uh, the cl put some clarity onto that. Um, Paul, could you maybe come back and deal with those two yes and well in terms of um the the well you've heard something already about the publication of yeah. in, in the broadest sense of these works so we're going to be looking for every way to uh to uh let people know about the the uh the the the, the effects and the and the work and the music itself of this project so yeah i, I suspect we'll be able to stream everything and uh, yeah. capture everything that's and hopefully, maybe even the BBC will be interested to take that, you know, in three years' time, uh, and do something with it, and take it even further for this ride. Um, the the eight composers, yeah, actually, the Seven Hills was never really supposed to have uh, James McMillan as part of the hills. Isn't he's not really a hill, if you like. Um, he is the birthday, and uh, if you remember, I, I talked about the the foothills to the birthday. So the seven seven composers. On the hills, and then uh, this uh, exciting moment where James McMillan has agreed to write as a, a, a fairly major piece, which will incorporate the present students uh, at that time, and also the alumni, and even maybe Alexander McCall Smith on his bassoon. We we, we don't know that yet. Do we'll have to ask. Him. <laughs> Thank you. I have two more questions for you. One is a question about. Where will all seven poems be available and will they be published? That sounds like one for you, Sandy. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, yes, I've, I've slightly jumped the, the gun. I think the, the project knows that I did that. I, um, they're available already in a, in a book, which is a collection of my, my poetry called In a Time of Distance. And of course, that's got a wonderful illustration by Ian McIntosh there. Um, uh, so they're, they're a section of, of that uh, collection of poetry, but I, I would hope that they would be published in all sorts of places. As far as I'm concerned, I've given them to St. Mary's and, and St. Mary's can uh, and publish them where, wherever, they, wherever they wish. Um, uh, but certainly they, they are already in, in book form now. Thank you. And I have a question of whether there will be any performances on any of the hills. I see a nodding head there, Valerie. Yes, actually, um, our composer, Neil Thomas Smith, whose designated hill is Carlton Hill, will be actually writing two pieces. Um, he's planning to write a companion piece for the very loud instrument. So I'm not sure if bassoon's involved, Alexander, but um, 
uh, mainly no mainly uh, brass and wind, and that is planned to um, be performed actually on the hill, as an as a, a specifically site specifically composed um, piece for the project. And if that could be combined with the Beltane festivities, Peter. That's all of the questions that we've had. Mm -hmm. That's that's the question. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I wonder if uh, anyone has anything else that they would like to add. To I mean, for instance, I was one thing. I was just wondering, Jay, um, about the um, your pieces, the pieces, but you and the other composers. Um, you're writing for effectively um, music school students. Does that present its own challenges? Um, not particularly, or it certainly didn't for me anyway. Um, I suppose because we're, we're still, we're dealing with incredibly high caliber musicians here anyway. Um, and so the, the, the concept, as you can see, we've, we've got a, a portion of the score. This is um, bar 43 from, from the score here. Um, as you can see, it's actually built up from very tiny sort of um, fragments of material. Um, and so part, part of the, um, the concept is, is, um, is driven by Hutton's findings, um, which became a really important aspect to the, um, to the music as, as the process of like renewal and decay is, is reflected in the very design of the piece. So what, what I wanted to do was to, to write a piece whereby we can, as it were, literally hear the Earth's primordial process as this renewal and decay um, sort of presents itself in these elemental embryonic musical ideas as they're built up in layers. So much in the same way that the rock formations um, are built up. So the, the music itself didn't necessarily have to lend itself to um, material that was going to be incredibly difficult to play anyway, because I wanted, a, I wanted the material to be so fragmentary um, that any instrument or any musician would be able to, to approach it. And actually I should say that um, the initial lineup of instruments, as you could see from the score there, um, is for percussion, piano and string quartet. But as restrictions ease, um, I'm planning to actually add some more instruments into the mix as well. So that it's a bit more of a, a kind of free open score so that we can add some more musicians, because obviously at, at the, the present time, um, we're unable to include wind instruments or breathing instruments into this. So the plan is to, to add some um, flutes and oboes, clarinets and, and bassoons. Um, you know, Alexander, if you want to come in and play, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're hoping to, to be able to expand that as well. So yeah, essentially I wanted to create a score that was going to be instantly accessible and playable by um, a, a wide variety um, of musicians so that anyone could, could be involved in this, um, what is essentially an open score. Mm -hmm. And just finally, to, back to Paul, um, what's next after this? Uh, oh dear, <laughs> that's a very unfair question. Um, this is uh, you know, a lot of effort so far and it's going to last us for, uh, for another few years. And, and uh, as you hear, the legacy hopefully will go on further. Um, people have been very generous to us uh, so far in shaping this. Uh, and they will hear the effects of uh, specialist music education, education in Scotland. And that really is my prime interest here that Scotland uh, continues to flourish uh, and continues to produce composers of the caliber of uh, Jay and uh, of the others. Uh, and that, um, yeah, uh, there is a very, there always has been a very strong um, message coming out of Scotland. And I, I want to hear that continue well into the future. Lovely. Well, on that note, um, I think uh, we we will uh, close the, the proceedings. Um, just one personal note, I realised there's a, a sort of strange link for me arising out of this and that my wife actually started schooling at Cumnock Academy, where you were, Jay, and ended up as the coming into St Mary's on the second year of its, of its existence. In other words, 49, no, not 49 years ago. Um, about 40 odd years ago. That's frightening. Anyway, um, so it just remains for me to say thank you to our four speakers, to Paul Stubbings, to Sandy 
uh, McCall Smith, to Valerie Pearson and Jay Caparo to thank you for your interest and participation um, and to add one more plug for Vox Carnix, which, as I mentioned at the start, is a new website for classical music in Scotland set up by former Herald Arts editor Keith Bruce and myself. Give it a try. We've been reviewing furiously since we launched in October and are delighted to be working with St Mary's on this project. So on that blatant plug, thank you and till next time, goodbye. <laughs>